up, guys? It's Drew from The Money Is Show, and we got another incredible guest for the show for you today. Uh, hey, this is a buddy of mine. came all the way from Florida, uh, my hometown, and uh, came all out here, uh, built a company as an entrepreneur, just like me and you, built a company that ultimately sold for nine figures. You think about that, starting from scratch and ultimately selling this thing off for uh, nine figures. Uh, took that money, launched a, uh, about seven or eight different other uh, companies after that now. Two of those we're gonna dive into today that I absolutely love. Uh, one is style, because you know, guys know I love sneakers and shoes. He's got a pair on today he'll show us. Uh, that's a, uh, it's called uh, moderncasual.com. You guys can go to the website. And then also his new company that he's just about launching uh, when this show comes out, actually should be launched called Check Please, which is an app. You should go download it right now called Check Please. Uh, I think it's gonna be one of those innovating companies that's gonna change how we do the food industry quite a bit. And so we're gonna ask him those two questions on the, on the or those two topics today on the show. Brian, I appreciate you coming all the way from Tampa, Florida, being on the show today. It's great to be here, I love it. Yeah, dude, it was a, a crazy day because I had uh, another one of your friends, uh, G, on the show right. uh, that was supposed to be the show on Monday. And then uh, me and him started doing stuff together and then three days later, he's still here. I can't get the guy to leave. And we shot the show this morning, and literally you guys were like crossing paths uh, at my office. Yep. Um, but was cool because you guys actually know each other. He's amazing. Yeah, you and G, uh, not in the same industry or same field, but maybe the same industry to a certain degree with technology and, and that side of the business. Right, just an incredible entrepreneur with a disruptive way of looking at things. It's my favorite. Yeah, but dude, you have that same disruptive, uh, like the whole check please is disruptive right. of what you're doing uh, a side of it as well. Let's back up for a little bit. Uh, I want to tell me a little bit about you were born in a very unique place uh, that I would never saw coming when you came to my office. Let's talk a little bit about that, what it was like growing up. And then, uh, uh, um, and then from there, let's talk about this first business that you exited uh, several years ago. Uh, but first, let's talk about growing up. Where were you born at? What was that like? Sure. I was born and raised in Haiti, tropical S tropical island. <laughs> Crazy, dude. Haiti. Who would have thought, man? Thir third world country. Yeah. Uh, I find it ironic that uh, I do so much with technology today, and you know, I literally was born and raised with no electricity. No, yeah. No internet, no computers, no electricity. And, and you lived there till you were? Till I was eight years old. Eight years old. My, my parents, uh, my mom was there a total of 19 years. Uh, wow. All said and done, I was born, we left when I was uh, eight. Um, so went from from there. Actually, went to Russia after that, doing mm -hmm. nonprofit work. Uh, Haiti, it never got below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Russia never got above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, maybe plays into my disjointedness. I still think in Fahrenheit yeah. if it's warm temperature and Celsius if it's if, if it's, it's cold. If it's cold, yeah. How long were you, did you stay in Russia? About four years. For four, so Say. to 12 ish, 13 ish, whatever yes. it was, uh, in Russia. Yes. Uh, so born in Haiti, uh, lived there till eight. And then eight to eight to twelve in Russia. Yes. And your parents came from the kind of the nonprofit world of of he heavy heavy give back basically. Yes. Uh, from there, you guys come back to the states. You go through school, and uh, and actually before I even get to your massive exit, you actually had like a little cool one that me and you were talking about in high school. Uh, was kind of where you first fell in, in love with this idea of building a company and selling it off. What I did. What was the one in high school? It was. Well, I got into web design and uh -huh. web hosting, and I quickly realized, this is where I fell in love with the idea of recurring revenue, yeah. is that I could go out and I, I might be able to make, you know, whatever it was at the time, I don't remember exactly, but, you know, I could charge 20, 30 bucks for helping somebody fix their computer, and it was transactional. So I, uh -huh. did, I did the hour, great money for a high school or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, you like, dude, rolling. Exactly. But when I did web hosting, it might only be, like, th let's just say $12 to sure. the 20 but it was $12 every single month, no yeah. matter how long, as long as I did a good job, as long as the customer was happy. And uh, that's when I got into web hosting. So I ended up selling the company uh, in order to go to college because I yeah. couldn't keep it going. You built that in high school and kind of exit out of it and go to college. Back up for a second though, uh, obviously we're about the same age. You're a little bit, you're 36, a little bit younger than me. I'm, I'm 38. Um, um, I look a lot better. That was one of the things that you was do. voted here. Uh, I don't want to bring I'll it up. There. Yeah, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything, but it was voted on. Um, it was voted by me, <laughs> and uh, I won. But uh, we're about the same age. Look, I went to high school in uh, web hosting, like never crossed my brain uh, in high school, and much less running a web hosting business, I'd say. Mm -hmm. What got you into internet, web hosting, software? What got you into that side of it? You know, like a lot of entrepreneurship, probably an accident. Okay. You know, it was just meeting a need. Uh, I was doing computer repair work. I was doing, uh, you know, I was, I was in getting into technology and building uh -huh. computers and uh, fixing them and, you know, enjoying the process. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I don't remember exactly who it was the first one, but it was probably one of those clients that said, hey, I need web hosting. Can you hook me up? And um, You're like, you I know, got the way that I think. Well. One or two, I might ref have referred it out. And probably by about my third customer that said, hey, I need a $12 a month. I don't know why it's 12 is yeah, sure. in my mind today, but that's what I think I originally started charging for hosting. Um, and so probably was about the third one, I said, hey, this is a business Wait a idea. Second. I could be collecting this money. <laughs> so, and I still remember uh, actually setting up the server in my dad's home office. Yeah. And then having him upgrade his internet <laughs> at home and then having to you know, reimburse him yeah. so that we had all these you know, web traffic coming into our house. Um, and you're so. 16, 17 years old yeah. uh, doing this. Quickly, uh, I grew that. Uh, you sell it out, you go to college. Uh, take us up to uh, your, I'm going to call it a cloud company, technology company, cloud company uh, that you get into and then kind of sell that off because that was a big deal. Well, I kindly, I almost re went back to what I was doing in high school is when I started, I graduated college yeah. and started um, what became the cloud company and we yeah. were an IT company. Okay. So we, we followed the money, we did everything for everybody. Right. If you called me up and you said, hey, I need a phone system, great, we have one for we you. We got it. Hey, we need to drop X, X, here's our budget for a video conferencing, great, we'll do it for you. We sold T1s, we sold um, anything you could think of that mm. was tech, we were full service IT. And about six months into it, I got a phone call from somebody that um, trusted me. Uh, they were in a, in a bad spot, and uh, I'd build a level of trust with them. They said, hey, we have 400 users, yeah. uh, one customer running this particular Microsoft accounting product. Can right. you help us out? Servers weren't being backed up. There was a whole bunch of things that, were, uh, that they needed help with. And so uh, to me, it was just one, another customer absolutely will help you out. We set them up, we, we spun up a data center back then that was pretty uh, cutting edge at the time uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, basically started doing cloud computing without even really knowing it. Yeah. Nobody called it cloud no computing one called it back, cloud then. back then. And to my fault, I never really thought anything more about it. I never went for another single customer. We continued to do computer repair and consulting and whatever it was that we did. And um, the company grew, you know, we were, we were scaling, um, you know, probably in the double digits, you know, nothing impressive, but, you know, healthy growth. But I was always struggling with staff and cash flow and, you know, trying to, to solve problems and have customers call me at life. 10. Normal entrepreneur Yeah, and I remember distinctly, I don't remember where my family was at the time, but for whatever reason, it was my dad and I one evening and uh, he took me out to dinner and we were just chatting. And my dad's not a, a business guy, but he's very smart. And he said, hey, you, you have this one customer uh -huh. for like the past two years. They've been writing you a nice, big, solid check. They're happy with you. I mean, it dwarfs, I knew, he was, I was transparent enough. He sure. knew it dwarfed all the other revenue I had. <laughs> right, right. He's like, why don't you go do more of that? And that was the aha moment. I was like, you're right, I should yeah. just focus on that. So uh, I still remember that conversation going back to my team, which is pretty small. We had less than 10 people at the time. And we started um, just stopping doing. We actually had a, a stop doing list. And the next person that called proverbially and needed that phone system, we said, we don't do it anymore. Yeah. And so we started to not do other things and really laser focused in and we said, you know what? We're gonna be the best in the world um, at Microsoft Dynamics. And I'll geek out a little bit on you here, but it was Kay. NAV. 2009 R2. Yeah. Uh, who's no ever idea heard what of you it? Just said, who's yeah, ever heard no of it? Idea. The funny thing is, I couldn't. I never did know how to use the product. Okay. And I still don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we did is we hosted it. We did the servers for it. Okay. We we don't. We didn't know accounting. We weren't an accounting company. We were a server company. And so um, we looked around and we found out that very few people have 400 accounting bookkeepers in one company. Right. right Even right. a big company. I don't That's know, a maybe a, a dozen yeah. bookkeepers, right? And this is a unique, um, unique scenario. They were doing back office processing, and uh, there was a reason they had 400 people using their accounting software. Um, They're doing a lot of fund and donations and that type of a thing. And so when we looked around, we were like, hey, we're, we might be one of the biggest in the world. Probably we're the biggest in the US. And so overnight, it was just a mindset switch. Uh -huh. And it really was a life lesson game changer for me is that I didn't actually change anything that we did monetarily. I didn't write a bigger check to, to something or somebody. We used our existing data center, our existing team. It was just that mindset that completely changed the business. And uh, we started just pursuing that. We got some great attention from Microsoft. Microsoft was just then building out cloud. They were just 
because it's the like 2008, nine. It would have been probably at that point, maybe 12, 2012 okay. at that point. Um, they were they hadn't even picked the Azure name yet, by the way. Okay. They had a couple other iterations. Microsoft often does that. They do like a code name type of a thing, and um, so we we raised um, we didn't raise we got grant money from Microsoft, and we just laser focused. And at that point, you know, we just went to exponential growth because we could quickly onboard customers consistently by being laser focused on one product. And when we did one product, we found out there were three or four or five other Microsoft mm -hmm. products that we could do very easily with, with not even changing the mold, our basically. Team. Yeah. So there, there's two things there that I want to I circle back to that I think are very, very, very crucial in the, in the process that you mentioned there. Because from there, you sell off here in just a second, and we'll talk about uh, ultimately selling it off for nine figures. Two things I want to talk about. Number one, you mentioned, um, let's talk about laser focus first. Because obviously in entrepreneurial world, you have entrepreneurs like myself when I got started. We typically have ADD. We don't right. like to work for other people. And we have 93 different ideas nonstop. Uh, and, we, and we run down these different paths. I struggle with this. Uh, coming out of the gate, I struggle with this. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you kind of did as well. Like, yeah, we'll do that for you. Yep, we'll do that for you. But there's a, there is great, great secret sauce in laser focus as an entrepreneur. Uh, tell me about your thoughts on laser focus going deep out of the gate as an entrepreneur. I think it's it's critical, you know, yeah. to build that build that following, build that practice, build that core. Um, if you go shallow too fast, uh, I mean, there's so many analogies from building to planting. You know, if you don't have deep enough soil for a plant, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we see it all the time. But it certainly applies as an entrepreneur that if you go too wide too quickly, there's no roots. Yeah, and when the weather changes in business and a customer pays you late or something changes with your banking or whatever, you don't have enough, you don't have enough soil to, to keep growing. Uh, whereas to go deep and um, solid and, and build a solid foundation and make sure you're profitable, you've got a profitable product that a customer is willing to stand in line for and buy from you, uh, then marketing becomes easy, sales becomes easier, and then everything else becomes easier, raising capital or an advisory board, whatever it is that you need. Um, so to me, it's one of the foundational things with entrepreneurs, and, and I remind myself of that, is pick one thing and laser focus on it and do it really well. And that's the second piece of it. That's tell you there's two pieces that you brought up. You said it again right there. It's a mixture of two things, is laser focusing on something, especially out of the gate when you're, when you're kind of launching your entrepreneurship, right? It's like laser focus on something and then uh, be really well, or earlier you said be an expert at that one thing. Uh, I think there's great, great value in uh, laser focus and then freaking being the best in the world at that one thing right there out of the gate as much as you can right own that one thing right there which is what you ended up doing with your uh, cloud company I'll call it technology company you laser focused and they became like the biggest and the best in the world at that one thing right there right. which led into so much so much more success I mean right now you're running eight nine different companies that you've now started since then um, um, and you have these other like 12 of the partnerships that you're running as well that you have on the side. But do that didn't come until later when you had hyper massive laser focus and mm -hmm. became great at that one thing right there. Mm -hmm. um, I think those two things that you just mentioned are super important for the viewers, listeners on, on becoming successful as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Do those two things out of the gate. Laser focus, you got great advice from your dad, kind of a, um, a, a little piece of luck there, which mm -hmm. brings up a great question on entrepreneurship. Do you think there is some luck involved in success in entrepreneurship? I do. I, I, do, too, I, I do think there's an element of luck. There is. Not to be too, you know, uh, ethereal, but um, timing mm. is, is another thing that plays into luck right. as well. Uh, if you're at the right time, at the right place as an entrepreneur, um, I think I think technology is maybe even a little bit more subjective than other uh -huh. industries. I, I could be wrong, just tech is the space that I know. Uh, but timing is, it, it can be everything and, and a lot of luck yeah. does matter. I do, I do think that there's a piece of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and Instagrammers will talk about, you know, uh, you know, grinding, 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 work and work and work and so forth. But dude, they're, they're, I'm just telling you, there's a piece of luck that involves like all these entrepreneurs that I interview. There's mm -hmm. a piece that was a, a, a great stroke of genius or luck that happened to them and, or timing in the market that it was just the right time. They couldn't control that it was the right timing in the market for what they had at the moment in time. 
uh, they can control the, you know, getting to that place and putting in the work to, to you know, to make sure they're ready when it happened. But that I agree with, that, that there's a grind piece. But there is also a piece of luck there. Your dad coming to you, who's not a business person, who wasn't like some other co-founder of another company, mm -hmm. was really in non nonprofit work, um, sat down and said, hey, I see something that you're not seeing right now, which is for you a great stroke of luck, that hat. And, and obviously, then you laser focus, became great at that, which led into this massive sale exit, which led into nine other companies right now. We ended, up like with, we ended up with two data centers, office overseas. You know, we got absorbed into a larger conglomerate. Um, I've heard it said, and I don't know where to give credit where credit's due. I don't know who, I, who I thought it. I think I said it, whatever it is. I, Maybe Andrew Cole I said, said it. it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Um, is most businesses fail due to growing too fast mm -hmm. than slow, at mm -hmm. least statistically? Um, maybe not from a serial entrepreneur, if you know what you're doing, maybe the, the well, person is higher, but it, growing too quickly is, is actually can be a bad thing. And sure. I think that comes down to the laser focus is yeah, to yeah. do one thing well. I love that point. Uh, let's go back to the exit here. So you go exit the company. Uh, what was it like? What made you get to the point where you're like, I mean, you got two data centers, you got offices overseas, you're in Charlotte, you got this staff, you're growing, your Microsoft is freaking giving you grant money. Um, with all the work that you're doing with them. Uh, what makes you say, mm, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna unload it all. W w take me to that point where you're like, I'm out, I'm gonna sell. I'd like to say it's because I was smart, but uh, Go it, back to luck it wasn't. <laughs> uh, I had some good advisors. Yeah, I, had some, some, I, I had sought out some advice from people, yeah. uh, much uh, older and wiser, and said, hey, this is probably something to consider. The first two times, um, we actually got, the company we sold to, we actually got offered three times, and the first two times I said no. Okay. <laughs> and the third time, one of my VPs actually kind of went down that path a little bit further and came back and said, hey, you should really think about this. Uh, it really came down to two things. One is that the market was changing. Mm. And we had, what I felt, done a really good job around private cloud, but we saw Microsoft and we saw Google and, and Amazon getting into public cloud, which was just a different lane. And we either had to make a conscious decision of do we want to jump into that lane and reinvent um, in a way the, the product became a race to the bottom, mm -hmm. which um, you know, we get into storage and you know, it's, it's commodity play. Whereas we were a bit of a premium play. And so between that and timing and luck and some advice and just kind of seeing the writing on the wall, it just, it just seemed to, to make sense um, to go ahead and, and take the exit. And I think I realized that I enjoyed building the business, but when we hit seven figures, a whole different set of things came into play, mm -hmm. and we were gonna have to retool and, and get into a whole nother level of HR and insurance, and it it's just, like massive it just growing lined up. pain that's about to hit, right? That always exactly. happens throughout the process. Because at, at, at some point you're like, you gotta start having the conversation or mentally to yourself of like, do I sell or do I go the next level and try to go public with it eventually? Like those conversations start happening as you're growing and, and then you think about all the stuff that takes place and you gotta make a decision. And we, we picked, I believe, a, a fantastic company to sell to and they had a great culture and they had everything in place and uh, a phenomenal CEO and it was like, let, let's, let's do this deal. Uh, when, you go, when, when you went to sell, uh, take me back just for a second, were, were you, did you come to that realization that you wanted to sell and then went and kind of put your company on the market per se, behind the scenes but on, up for sale? Or did you get approached and you're like, huh, maybe I should look at this. I know you said three different times, but were you forced on they approached you or did they approach you just naturally? We, they approached us naturally. Natu okay. We saw what we were doing. Gotcha. Uh, obviously, we talked to G a lot uh, uh, just recently and, and we we're talking about exiting companies. Yes. And you're talking about the, the multiplier of your, um, of the sales, right? Like, like mm -hmm. are you getting a 2X, a 3X, a 5X uh, multiplier on it? Technology is one of those that have, has a larger uh, X factor uh, multiplier on the back end of it. It does. Versus a service kind of company, if you will. Right, because you've got not only assets, which is your IP, but then you've got revenue, you've got, you know, um, a whole bunch of things, M monthly active users. I mean, yeah. that's why if I, I've been there before I scratch my head, you know, how are these, some, some of these companies selling for a huge dollar amount with no revenue? Right. Well, it's because of their users or their data. So right. there's a number of intricate moving parts um, that go into to the valuation of a business. So let's go from here because here's what I want to get to now is the cool entrepreneurship you got going on. You're 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 kind of a unique breed because you're this coder, 
that can code. I know you don't code right now, but you come from the internet kind of coding world, uh, development world. But dude, you are a crazy entrepreneur, like serial entrepreneur, like visionary entrepreneur. But you, then you had this coding side um, w with you as well. I know you, like I said, you don't code right now, but you you have that component inside of you. Um, but yes, you said my office. It's like there was we talked nothing code. We talked all entrepreneurship. You got eight different companies you're you're going through now that you got up and going. Uh, and for clarity, just for the viewers, we just talked about laser focus with that one company. Now you got eight, but there's a difference. You're in a different spot now, right? You have capital, mm -hmm. uh, you've got staff, you've got a team, you've got resources you can reach out to. This is where it kind of gets fun in the entrepreneur mm -hmm. world. Do you agree? I, I do. And for me, each logo becomes its own laser focus. And mm -hmm. that's why I do multiple things um, is find a team, find yep. a system, find IP. Some of those I've invested in, they were not my idea. Other ones were my idea, and I just was able to stand up enough of a framework to make it work. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't ha advise having a company that does too many things. Yeah. Don't have a company that does shoes and apps and marketing and landscaping. Right, right, right. right. You know, not to get silly, but um, you can you do just, too many things. You just things did my whole model, bro. Logo. <laughs> I, literally, I, did, I do all those right now. Right. And, Hopefully uh, under different logos. <laughs> no, no. So uh, you have these, these eight different ones, but I want to talk about I want to talk about two of them because two of them. I mean, I, li I like all the stuff you got going on, but two of them are like freaking awesome, dude. Uh, one of them uh, start off with uh, modern casual. Um, okay, so back, back us up. Was this your idea? Did you partner with someone on this one? Did you buy into it? Uh, uh, how did it kind of start first? Well, it started just from a uh, seeing a seeing a gap. So okay. in, in Europe, yeah. it's pretty common. I, I spent a lot of time mm -hmm. in Europe, um, travel a lot of countries. And in Europe, uh, they're very fashion forward. You yeah. can go get a, a custom suit anywhere. And it just kind of makes sense. You get a new suit, you get a new pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and here in America, you know, you and I can go proverbially to any street corner and get a, get a nice custom suit. But uh, a lot of us, you know, when it comes to shoes, it's like, hey, there's, you know, two different colors. Yeah. Uh, at least in the... Um, oh, trust me, dude. I yeah, if you look in dress shoes, right? Yep. You want black or brown or... And if you're lucky, you get like a cordovan. Exactly. A cherry or, you know. Exactly. So it's kind of a thing where I think America is a little bit behind the eight ball. For sure. From custom shoes perspective. So at the same time with my cloud company, we were getting around and playing in uh, what's called a CPQ system or our uh, a cost price quote, which is just a fancy way of saying you design whatever you want and then the computer will just outline the parts requirement. So just like you're, you're making um, dinner this evening, you got your ingredients and so you go to the store and you get those things. So really what we did is, is, is pretty simple in a way. Uh, we just built, built the tech and marketed it and packaged it all up is we allow people to design their own custom shoe. We say you're one in a billion, why shouldn't your shoe be one in a billion? Yeah. And design do you want dressy? Do you want casual? Uh, do you want something flashy with red on it? Do you want to go low key? And then that CPQ system literally line items everything. And then we've, we've partnered um, with companies in Europe that are good at doing that. And then we, we bridge the gap with them. And so they're handmade in Europe, shipped over here, uh, just trying to make it more accessible for Americans to quickly have an affordable custom shoe. What's crazy is, uh, so I did a lot, ton of overseas travel and uh, did a ton of custom suits overseas uh, from all different locations, places. I think my favorite place being was Singapore. I love getting my suits in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And um, as I started buying all these custom suits, I was literally stuck on the shoe side because I had custom suits. Then I had a custom tie maker that would make I just pick your fabric and the length and the width and like all this stuff and there's 10,000 colors you could choose from your ties and the shirts. Everything was custom except for one freaking thing was the shoes. And every time I came back to the States, I ran the, I went to Nordstrom and it was like, these are your choices, right? And like you said, there's like three colors, maybe four. Maybe you get into like a, um, what do they call that color? Like the caramel camel, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it. Um, anyways, uh, color of shoe. And I went back to Singapore and said, uh, I'm gonna see if they have a custom shoemaker here. Sure enough, it was like, well, they're all over the place. I had my first pair of custom dress shoes made. And it, it to me, was funner than making, getting the custom suits made. Um, it, this was like a, what do you call them, cobble? The shoemakers, aren't they called like a? Cobbler. Cobbler, the cobbler right? right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And dude, that's, that's just a little bitty, a little bitty like office on the side street, just him. And uh, we went in there, like measure my foot, put this mold on it. Um, did all this took took like three different appointments like six week process 
to do all this stuff, right? And uh, then he put all the different leathers, and I was like, dude, this is crazy. There's like suits almost. Right. And I was able to pick all this different, and then the, the, the points and, the, and the, the soles of them, like everything, the inside of them, how thick this, like all this stuff. I had a blast it, making shoes. It's fun creating things, right? Yeah. You know, it's whether we, we, as people, typically enjoy creating food and creating mm -hmm. experiences, and uh, this kind of brings the, the shoe side. And one of my favorite things, I don't get to see all the shoes and orders and everything, but one of my favorite things is when somebody I know does buy a pair of shoes and then they get delivery of it yeah. and they'll text me the yeah, yeah. picture and they're like, this is just like Christmas morning. Because yeah, yeah. Well, you got you got to, you got to text today while I did. we're in the office. I did. Uh, from one of your top clients. Yes. Top buyers. Top, top buyers. Uh, of Modern Casual, which is who? My wife. Your wife. Exactly. <laughs> one of the top buyers. She, and she, uh, she got a pair of shoes today. She sent you a photo. You actually showed it to me. A uh, pair of, what were they? Like purple? She got pink, pink Chelsea pink boots. Chelsea boots made for her. Just for fun. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they were cool looking. They're, they're awesome. And uh, of course, you have a pair on not not pink Chelsea boots, but you have a pair of. I I shoes left on. my pink boots at home. But, uh, uh, right here, dress shoes on today, and they're kind of like if the camera can't see them, they're kind of like a cool black blue right colored uh, like fade in uh, into them. Yeah, I did a patina finish on these uh, with orange shoelaces, just for fun. Goes yeah. great with jeans. Goes great with a, a, a bluish type of a suit. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I made I, the story. I made that the pair, and that pair cost me, if I'm if my memory serves me right, like close to thirty five hundred dollars wow. for that pair of like handmade one at a stitch at a time. Um, but you probably didn't regret it either. No, I freaking love them. I still have them, right? Right. Um, I got to the states. This was several years ago. Uh, so when did you launch? A, a modern casual. Yeah, so uh, you know, entrepreneurship. I, I technically launched last uh, February. Okay, which is terrible timing. Oh, it's perfect. What could go wrong? Uh, yeah, <laughs> nobody, nobody bought shoes at yeah, all. Nobody, <laughs> nobody was going to work. It's all uh, unless you were maybe the UGG business. Exactly. And you so could sell shoes. It failed miserably. Basically, just put it on pause. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, other things I was working on exploded, um, and we just relaunched this January. Okay. And get a lot of lot of. Uh, coverage now we're I think you know we're lucking out in some ways we've had a, a number of athletes and, and movie people and artists starting to buy the shoes and um, you know people are buying shoes are going out in public now and yeah uh, it's taken off a lot better than it did last January because uh, so when I when I was doing this is like three or four years ago I came by the States couldn't find freaking a, a shoemaker over here really and it, the, but I found some app on Instagram ad or something it was and there was it was custom to a certain degree Custom shoes, sure. Um, not to the extent that, that you do yours, and nowhere even close to what I did in Singapore. But at least there was something similar to it, and you could pick a bunch of stuff. And I bought like six or seven pairs, um, but they were, and I wore them, but they were not anywhere near what I was looking for. Like the quality mm -hmm. wasn't there. It was cool because I get different colors and design or whatever on the on the dress shoes, but not the quality. When you look at your shoes; those are quality shoes. Like for dress shoes, those are quality shoes, dude. Um, out of curiosity for me, how much does a pair of shoes like those cost on your app? So these are... Uh, or three, website, sorry. So around, website. around $300. Yeah, yeah. That's so perfect. So it depends on how you customize it, mm -hmm. but uh, a men's dress is, is around $300. And you can get uh, dress shoes. You have a, a style of tennis shoe sneakers, uh, like the casual dressy sneaker. We do. So like a, um, a call an Italian Corsini sneaker mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. trainer or something like that. It's going to be a little under $200. Um, you know, I, I tell people it's priced comparably. So if you're looking for... $180 trainer. We've got one for probably about that. So, um, and then if you're going for exotic skins or something crazy, it can be more than more than yeah. 300. But you have a, a with your website, you actually get like a 3D image of your foot, uh, part of the technology that that's attached to it. You do. You can scan your scan your foot in 3D against an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper. Yeah. It renders your whole foot in 3D. You load that right into moderncasual.com, and it's then crazy. you can spin the shoe around in 3D. Yeah, and we literally have you sign off. Uh, like, yep, this is exactly pick what I color, want. Pick your color, pick your shoe strings, whatever it is, right? It can take up to four weeks, so it's gonna, yeah. it's not going to be done overnight. Sure. But it will be it will be handmade. Uh, you know, we use the same suppliers as the best of the best luxury. Uh, do you get Do you get Italy. to pick the inside uh, leather of the you shoe? Do. Yeah, you do. Yep. So in insole, inside laces, put a tassel on it. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And you get to pick uh, soles, whether you yes. want like the rubber, wood, whatever the different styles that are yes. out there. Yes. Um, yeah, so cool, man. I, I love, love that model that you got. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And to me, it's just about seeing an opportunity, mm -hmm. solving a problem, seeing a need. Um, I mean, even almost to this day, at least, at least when I launched it, I had pretty close family and friends. When I would say custom shoes, I just get like a deer in the headlight <laughs> look yeah. of like, well, are you talking orthopedics? Are you talking, I've got a bone spur? Like, 
here in the U.S. I think like, like Ron Paul. So actually, what I think about when right. people say that, right? Like I don't know if you remember him wearing like those orthopedic shoes running for president. Right. Remember that? Right. That's what most people think about when they think custom shoes. That's what people shoes. think about, right? Yeah. Now, now not everybody's as fashion forward as you are. You know, yeah. people that love fashion totally get it. Yeah, Mini Finny. But remember, that's they call me Mini Finny. <laughs> you know what that you know what that means when the rare birds that actually knows what that means. Uh, yeah, most people don't know the fashion that, that side of it that, that's pushing out there, right? Right, and I think that trend is coming to the U.S. and uh, I think that's why why we're getting momentum now. And yeah, no, it's, it's a freaking I love 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 that idea of the of the shoes. If they want a pair of shoes, uh, men or women, children, size five, okay. so size five or six, um, so not small kids, but you know, when you hit about that size, yeah. you can get them. So men or women uh, shoes, boots, etc., uh, sneaks. They can go to uh, moderncasual.com. Moderncasual.com. Right? That's not an app, just a website they can go to for that right there. Yes. Uh, right on. So that's one that you launched uh, that I, I freaking love because I love the style, the, the, the shoes, et cetera, the customization I love, right? Thanks. Uh, then you have this new one, which I think is like, as you told me about it, I know you're in the process of like launching. You're in beta right now. This is one that you think it will be, could be one of your biggest exits you've ever will have. Yes. Uh, if this thing takes off, which it, I mean, talking through it, I don't know how long, how much you're allowed to tell or not tell right now. Sure. But dude, it seems for like to also. me, like it totally will work. Like I'm looking at, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're looking for the holes. Like where is it that we can punch a hole in it? Like we sat my office, right? Right. Just keep it between you and I. Yeah. Yeah. No one else. Right. Period. You know what I mean? Just, just me and you. Uh, but dude, it's a freaking innovative, crazy, cool concept. That's just not out there. I can't believe it's not out there. It's one of those like you, that you're telling me about, I'm like, wait, this doesn't exist. Surely this exists. And it doesn't. Well, I remember the first time I went to a restaurant, um, probably, you know, n end of last year, I think it's approaching Thanksgiving. Yeah. Restaurants were starting to open back up again in Florida. And, um, you know, everybody didn't want to put menus on the table and yeah. everybody just being extra respectful and careful and health conscious. And I see this QR code on the table and, it, you know, scan your phone and we've, we see them all the time now. But yeah, like, that's like, that's all they do. Yeah. And you scan your phone and I, I, I see basically the entire you know, what is it, like a 30-inch menu mm -hmm. is like shrunk down to <laughs> yeah. my yeah, little zoop. my little phone. And it's it was maddening to me yeah. trying to zoom in and scroll around and like this is this is kinda kinda crazy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find myself ordering very simple food. Yeah. Uh, say I just want Give chicken, me the chicken dinners. Something with chicken <laughs> on it. I don't know, I'm not gonna scroll around your one inch menu. And then simultaneously, uh, not never the same restaurant, at least in my experience, usually a different restaurant would then have the QR code on the receipt. Hey, just pay here, and it would work beautifully. Like, just scan it, pay, you're done. Wait, wait, um, pay on the receipt, what do you mean? Meaning I had already ordered my food, uh -huh. I'm checking out. I say, hey, check please, they give me the check, and there's a little QR code. Okay. You can scan the QR gotcha. code, and you can pay electronically. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. But in my scenario, it was never both. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. It was always a paper menu, <laughs> an electronic checkout, or electronic menu, and then I had to do a paper receipt. Yeah. So the entrepreneurial mind in me said, I feel like I feel like there should be a way to have one app Can that I does both of this. And uh, maybe it's a little bit of luck, maybe providence, fortune, I don't know. Um, I thought, check please. Like I say, check please, I wanna check out. Uh, there's literally like no apps in the app store called check please, which yeah. kind of blew my mind. Yeah. Um, I looked online, nobody's using the name check please. Look, look is there any universal, uh, mobile ordering ahead, order in place system, can't find one. Yeah. Now, there's some great brands that have their own apps, and there are great point of sale systems that if you want to go to, you know, uh, Joe's Diner and download Joe's app, that exists. But my vision for Check Please is just it's universal. It's, it's every restaurant, digital menu, order ahead, order in place. Let's try to help keep the world uh, safer, more sanitary. Let's join the 21st century where we don't have to have paper to, to check out. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things here that as we talked through it was like, number one, there's things that happened throughout COVID uh, that are going to be here to stay. Like, they're not going to go away. And I think this is one of them. Uh, if I'm a restaurant, like, not having to print menus on a consistent basis is a no-brainer for me. Right. To be able to put a QR code and let you scan that thing and, and that's what it is. Um, to me as a restaurant, uh, it's one of those things where it probably as a restaurant industry, they're gonna be like, yeah, 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 let's just keep this moving because your cost is gonna go down right. consistently, right? Menus, are they, they're always reprinting, right? right? And they're always updating and they're always changing and they have a new, a new item or a new, or they take this dish away, whatever it is, electronically, super easy. That's just an edit and you're done. 
printed menu, you got to go redo the whole the whole process again, right? So to me, like the menu that side of it, I think is here to stay just in general. Um, and then the, the ordering side, right? Like like the contact, like I think of Chick-fil-A, that's what we mean you were talking about. Right. I eat Chick-fil-A like four or five times a week and they had this massive drive through line that's mm -hmm. always freaking there. No matter when you go, there's a double lane drive through at Chick-fil-A. Um, and then, but you can go online on their app mm -hmm. and order their food, pull up to a special parking spot. They literally bring it out to you in your bag with all your stuff in it and, and leave, right? Almost like a type of like, almost like old school catering except for it's just individual now, right? Uh, completely pay for it online, do everything on the Chick-fil-A app. But when you told me the idea, it's like that only exists for a handful of restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, whatever it is. Right? There's a, the massive ones. Right, the big it ones. It exists for one. The big ones that have the capital to throw behind it. Yeah, because that's an expensive app to go build right there. The majority of them don't have it. The majority of them though, that does not exist, you still have to go either through the drive or through, go inside to order, um, whatever it is, you still gotta go do. Your app is kind of like, I don't want to call it this because because it's not what you're getting into, but it kind of reminds me of like DoorDash, yeah. where it's a mixture of like, it, DoorDash goes for all of these different restaurants. It's just you pick the restaurant and we'll deliver your food for you, right? Uh, I know you're not in the food delivering side of it. That's not what your, your angle is, but it's a app for all the restaurants. Right. Well, there's actually a, a growing trend right now. Uh, have you heard of the concept of a, a super app? Uh. So a, a super app is basically the one app that takes over the category. Okay. And we're seeing that because of app fatigue. Yeah, is sure. you can download three, four, five apps in any category. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to like yeah. six or seven or eight, I mean, it could be a fitness app. It could be like, it doesn't matter this what is category a social media is. app. Social like, media app. Got another freaking social media platform I gotta go join. And then guess what happens? Inevitably, the phone dies. You gotta get a new phone. You have to reinstall the apps, you know, and then there's an app update and you forget you're using passwords. So um, Amazon, some of the big guys are, are playing in this category, Facebook obviously, but there's a trend towards super apps. Interesting. And um, I'm trying to position Check Please as a, a super app that can just take over the category. Yeah, I know. No, it, it definitely has that potential where it's like, and I have not heard of super app, but I have app fatigue, mm -hmm. but therefore I would do super apps to the point of like, like I said, like every time they launch another uh, app, and this was, I was talking to somebody recently and they're trying to launch a big app. Like mm -hmm. it's actually a social media app, right? That they're trying to launch, which is like this massive uphill battle in general, like a okay. social media app, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a cool concept that, he, that, that they're going down or whatever and so forth. But, but uh, I was talking to him like, dude, um, cause he's like, um, well, I had this other product that I launched and I was able to sell all this product with my marketing team. So he's like, this is a free app. We'll be able to sell a ton of these cause it's free. And it's like, no dude, you're missing the point. Like when you talk about an app, app fatigue, mm -hmm. Even though your app is free, uh, you're not you, you have a you have a larger sale than your ABC product up here of twenty nine dollars. Right up here is twenty nine dollars is a transaction. I'm gonna be done this transaction in like five minutes when I go through your app, click on it, click buy now, done, boom, I'm over. The transaction is done in five minutes and it's twenty nine dollars. I'm done and ABC product is now mine. It's on its way. You're asking me for a twenty nine dollar transaction over here when you ask me for this app download and social media platform. Your, your ask, although it's free, uh, is way bigger. Because what you're really asking me for is my time. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any more of it. Like, mm -hmm. I have so many apps right now that, like, you know, my watch is constantly dinging um, because of all the apps. You have this app fatigue. And I'm like, dude, you're asking for a massive thing right. when you're asking someone to download this app. So the concept of super app is so, so relevant. I can't believe I've heard of it yet. So relevant, dude. So true. Heard first on the show. Yeah, dude. This is like breaking news. Absolutely. Uh, CNN, fake news, here we go, super apps. Exactly. Uh, so there's these super apps, and I think, like you said, Check Please could definitely be one of those freaking super apps that uh, you have DoorDash, Uber Eats, and it's like, dude, I, I cannot download any more delivery food services uh, in it, um, where Check Please has that potential like to own that space, man. I love, right. love the concept. I'm excited. I'm trying to take, um, let's say, take my own advice. I, I think I've made more more mistakes than I've had success. <laughs> oh, and cheers. I'm trying to follow the things that I've done. So I'm trying to be be disruptive. I'm laser focusing. You know, that's why we're not doing food delivery and we're not doing, you know, I don't know, time tracking. And there's so many things that yeah. could be cool, and uh, that as entrepreneurs, it's tempting to solve. But it, it is laser focused. It's just one or two things trying to do it really well. Uh, and at the same time, I have the, the attitude and approach that I want to solve something. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't work, I'm going to shut it down. Yeah. Like, I'm going to fail fast. If we launch it, even by the time the show hits the air, if we run it for two, three months and there's something, some blind spot that I'm not aware of, 
and it doesn't work, I'll just stop it. I'll, yeah. just, I'll just shut it down. And I, I tell entrepreneurs that all the time, say, I don't want to offend you, um, but you'll probably have to innovate no matter how smart you are, probably not going to land where you think you will. Yeah. And make sure you're watching for blind spots because um, that's just entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, right? Yeah, I know there's, there's so much truth you just hit, so I've got to back up for a second. I love the concept fail fast uh, in entrepreneurship, right? Sometimes we fall in love with our idea, check please, AC Sports, whatever it is. Right. You fall in love with it and you think, my God, this is the greatest thing that's ever, I can't believe this. Uh, and we, we fall in love too much to the point of where um, we sink everything into it. And it's like, dude, you should have bought Mission like two mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And now you're so far deep into it that it's a massive waste of time and money. It's a sinkhole. Because uh, you're in love with the idea versus understanding business versus an idea that, that's not going to work, right? So failing fast is badass idea. I'm thinking of a book. I know a book called Failing Forward. Mm. Is there a book called Failing Fast? Not that I'm aware of, but there yeah. could be. Dude, that is crazy. Um, hold on a second. Note to self, write a book called Failing Fast. That's, there you go. That's a great book title. Uh, for entrepreneurs. You know, the, the old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm sure somebody, somebody is... Uh, yeah, there's got to be a book called it, because that's a great freaking title there. On that note, you, you, you have all the success in entrepreneurship, CEO world, and I know you, you um, have a training course or training material videos that, that you're pumping out and working on right now. You do a ton of consulting, high-end consulting for CEOs and, and uh, kind of find that gaps where they have them and, and, and helping them through that with, with massive companies, not, not so much beginner startups of like a landscaping company, but massive companies here. Um, I, I want to. They need your, to have a product. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to <laughs> pick your brain here a little bit. Like sure. in your, in whether we pull some from your training course or or we go back into just your own personal experience. What are some of the big big lessons you learned as an entrepreneur or leader that it takes to be successful? One of them is really in the concept of minimum viable product or MVP. MVP. And I apply that to my own ideas, but I also recommend to people. You know, they they if somebody sits down and say, hey, I have this amazing idea for uh, an app. I can't tell you yeah. how many app ideas are here, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seems like one or two a week. Yeah. Is It's easy to get excited about the potential in the untapped market space. Yeah. And if I ever hear somebody say, hey, I want to raise a million dollars and build this app and solve this problem, the first thing that I'll challenge them is say, how can you test that? Not for a million, but for 100,000. And let me push you a little bit further and say, what can you do for $10,000? to test the concept. That's a minimum viable product. And I love that life is a bit of an open book test. I don't advocate for copying people unethically. Sure. But the reality is the big unicorns out there, we yeah. all know who they are. And mm -hmm. we can all go look and see what they did. Yeah. And they all do it. And in the concept of a, a wait list is the oldest trick in the book. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many people miss that. Is if you have a great idea and you're, you think it's gonna work, it literally is free to start a wait list mm -hmm. and start a landing page and we're going to get you VIP access and um, there's a whole community uh, of, of crowdfunding sites that we can go to that all support that idea and a lot of entrepreneurs miss that or just forget about it yeah and I think that's one one lesson that I try to apply and encourage people is just what's the bare minimum that will prove whether somebody will stand in line uh, it applies to technology. It applies to marketing. I'm a big fan of Derek Sivers. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you're Derek Sivers, he, I don't think it's a book. It's actually a chapter in the book called A Thousand Raving Fans. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably talk about it every week. But the concept is don't try to boil the ocean with marketing. Just find a thousand people that will stand in line and be groupies for your product. Mm -hmm. And really, it's not even about a thousand. It could be a hundred people. You have a yeah. hundred people that will literally stand in line for your idea pay any price that you set um, that will promote it to their friends and family and, and advocate for it, mm -hmm. then you've got an idea. And that's really where you can double down and, and scale and, and grow. So that's been, been, the MVP concept has really made a big difference for me and others that I know. Yeah, so the MVP concept, right, is like, is, is when you, so many entrepreneurs have this idea of like, my God, if I just had funding, uh, if I had this angel investor come along, if I had this VC come along, right. right, that puts up all this money, I could go invest all this, do this, and create this, and then it would it would launch. And um, kind of your pushback is, uh, okay, not a million, hundred thousand. Oh, that's badass. Okay, but what could you do for ten? Right. And you get them to just think outside the box of what what could you do for ten to get it out there in the market, ASAP. I mean, literally, it's funny that you mentioned that because we were literally just talking about about one of my companies mm -hmm. uh, that me and you were just 
kind of brainstorming on that, that I'm in the process of launching. Which blows everything I'm doing out of the water, by the way. No, no, no it's, just, it's, it's, it's just an idea, right? right? Like, you know, uh, that's why I love hanging out with you because you're a sur entrepreneur and you can, you can riff all day long right. with, with big picture stuff. But you actually brought that up, the MVP model, because I'm like, I, I got this, 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 and this. And you're like, dude, what, but, but, and I actually said, actually, it's already built. This phase one is actually done. It's not all the way, way done, but it's right. done. Like, I could go launch it tomorrow. And you're like, dude, go launch it. Like, go put it out there. Right. Go put it in a private Facebook group somewhere and just let people start playing with it. Mm -hmm. and, and not even in a beta side of it, but just like the MVP model where it's like, just put it out there mm -hmm. and, and uh, start using it and seeing what that feedback and, and consistency is. Mm -hmm. Or you put it out there and everybody's like, yeah, this thing sucks, bro. Because if I, if I put it out there, think about it. If I put it out there, and let people go use it, and they come back with, this is the worst product of all time, it will probably save me millions of dollars. Right. Versus like right now I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna, I need to, I'm gonna go get this million, which obviously at this point, mm -hmm. we can go get that millions of dollars um, with a couple phone calls. Um, but dude, it'd be much easier just to test it for like 20 Gs and drop it out there and see what happens on the MVP model that you right. have right there. Yeah, that's a great one, dude. Give me one more, give me one more. So w one of the one I learned from, uh, um, a, a mentor, actually, he's still a mentor of mine. He was a, um, an angel investor in one, one mm -hmm. venture I did a long time ago. But he taught me the, the concept of um, margin in relation to dollars. So Margin in relation to dollars. To dollars, okay. right. So I think there's a bit of a misnomer on monetary quantity, okay. right? So we see people, oh, they've raised X amount of money. Okay, that's good. They spent X amount of money on their product. Okay, that's good or they sell this high ticket price. Okay. And the reality is I think there's an element where, where none of that is real uh -huh. because raising a ton of money shouldn't really be a chip on your shoulder because you, you owe somebody something at yeah, that point. At least point. you're in massive debt. Having a high ticket product is awesome, but not if it costs you more than that price to sell it. <laughs> right, right. And, um, and then raising capital, same thing. You know, it, it's, it, it's the, the quantity doesn't matter. So one of my mentors, he, was early in on a company, became the president of the company, and they literally punched holes in metal. Okay. Uh, think a washer. Yeah, yeah. And they would have, and I don't know any actual real numbers, but just imagine sure. that it cost them a penny to make a washer. Mm -hmm. And they would sell it for uh, 10 cents. Yeah. What is that, 900 or 9,000 9, percent right. markup, depending right, on right. how you think about it, margin versus markup. It's huge. M more than most businesses, right? Yeah, a yeah. lot of businesses are very happy with 10%, right. you know, profit margin or 30%. Well, like total right? win. So charging a penny to, to a dollar, and it, it kind of humbled me a little bit as in, this is probably almost 10 years ago I learned uh -huh. this. Um, so he went on, he actually created a company that was $300 million company. Yeah. 17 locations, I mean, they did perforated metal everywhere. And if you think about it, you know, every trash can and every airport is all perforated metal, right? right. Massive, massive company, huge operation, hundreds of employees. Phenomenal businessman. I've learned a lot from him, and I applied that to my cloud company. And I still tell myself that today is it's it's not necessarily a good thing to to charge a high ticket or high price product. It could be, but it not necessarily is always. Yeah. Um, and so going back to even tying that into the MVP of it's okay to have a smaller product, but focus on the margin because you you basically have a successful business at that point if you have a product that you can produce well and profitably and then you've proven the market with your MVP concept is you've got people willing to stand in line for it, then, it, then everything else is easy, right? Raising money is easy, uh, scaling it is easy in comparison. Yeah, yeah, margin versus dollars is a great one, right? Because you think dollars, gross revenue, right? right? You can have businesses, and I, I literally am thinking about a business right now that, you know, they're a, was that, a nine figure business of gross revenue, and then like a, um, barely a seven figure net, mm -hmm. barely. You know what I mean? Like, like right. you're going from 109 million to like 1.1 million. Right. Um, numbers, massive. Sounds huge when you talk about it. Right. Um, but then you get down to brass tacks, it's, it's, it's not there. Versus you'd be almost better off having, what your mentor was saying was have a margin versus dollars. Right. And also made me think of a story of, I went to Cabo, this is like 2009. I just came, was kind of coming out of the crash. I went down to Cabo. And I'm on this like little boat tour they had or whatever it was, and and they're kind of cruising around the the cliffs. Have you ever been to Cabo? They have these huge cliffs on the on the sides there, and uh, this one kind of cliff comes out the most, and there's just a massive house, like 
like they were all beautiful beach houses off these cliffs. But then this one was like, you could the most expensive piece of land by far. And this guy or girl that had like unlimited views of everything and has built this monstrosity of a house, beautiful house there. And the guy that was on the boat tour was, was talking and I remember asking this guy, um, uh, cause he was going through like, Hey, who, who owns this house? Who owns this mm -hmm. house? And, and we were kind of talking and, and, and asked him who owned the house and he's like, or asked him what they did. And he said, dude, it's the craziest thing. He said, this guy, um, he makes the cardboard pieces that go inside boxes that you would get. He doesn't make cardboard boxes. He just makes like the, you know, if you get like, a, I think right now of like Lush uh, mm -hmm. bath bombs mm -hmm. and they have like, you know, you buy a box of 12 and you have that cardboard divider. Right. Like that's what he right. makes. Like that's all he does. But he makes them for everybody. These little bitty penny pieces right. um, of cardboard, but he makes them for every freaking company out there. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as like the margin versus, you know, the dollars, but then the margin can turn into the dollars. Exactly. On, on the back side of it. Yeah, done a great, great point there, dude. And, and this is like the, third time I think you've mentioned the word advisor, mentor, mentor uh, in your life. Mm -hmm. Where does that play a role at? It's been everything. You know, it, yeah. I think it, it's shaped who I am. Um, I would not be where I am without advisors and mentors. And yeah. part of the reason I do what I do today is, is I love, I love helping. And, and you kind um, of reverse the roles now where you, you now advise constantly and mentor people. But on the same hand, do you still have advisors and mentors? I do actually have yeah. the, the same, uh, the same, I've got a couple of people that have influenced me, but uh, the same business coach that I've met with every three weeks for almost 10 years. Wow. They're still using the same business coach. Same, same guy. He's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and he's been there through all kinds of things. And, and the, the, the impact of having somebody um, that I can trust, that knows me well enough, but isn't my friend or family. Mm. I mean, we're friends, but yeah, like sure. not not like a friend friend. Mm -hmm. Like we're not hanging out every Friday night. Yeah, because there's a, there's a layer there that when it's a friend, there's certain things that I'm I'm just telling you, you, you won't say. Right. When it gets down to brass tacks, right? When it's like crunch, you don't admit to certain things, whatever it may be, right? When you have a coach that's kind of a more or less a let's just call him a stranger, right? Or non-personal side that you can like unload some stuff that you need to not not from a therapist standpoint, but like. I need, to, I need to talk to you about this piece of my business that other people don't know about, right. but I need help on it. Right. That it, you can't go to your staff right now and talk about because it would affect culture in the company. It's super important to have that. I think everybody, everybody should have uh, somebody that they can talk to that mm -hmm. is that third party element. I mean, I, I love music and, and I, some of the best musicians in the world you, you know, that surprise me still have a vocal coach yeah, vocal or they coach. still have a guitar coach. You yeah, know, yeah. You're like, really, you don't even, like you're so famous. Nope, they still have a coach. Yes, yeah, like I, I work with, I think I told you about Alan Stein Jr. Right. And uh, uh, was a high performance coach for like these basketball players like Kevin mm -hmm. Durant, Steph Curry, all the, you know, Jordan. Not, he didn't do Jordan, but you have, you have Jordan, you're Tiger Woods in golf. These are the greatest golfer that's ever, let's say, existed for, especially for a time being and, and arguably still today. The dude has like five coaches. Like, think about that. How, why would Tiger Woods, let's say, need you to tell him how to swing a golf club? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, he still has them. He still has, why does Michael Jordan need a, a shooting coach? He's like the greatest shooter of all time, but he still had him. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that is like, they understood the value of having that outside opinion. Mm -hmm. You can't say that that guy was a better shooter than Michael Jordan, but that guy has a talent, that shooting coach has a talent that he can see stuff and angles and so forth that mm -hmm. even as the greatest shooter, let's say Michael Jordan, uh, wasn't able to see and feel because you're not looking at yourself, if you will. Right. Same thing in business. I think there's a big piece that people miss is they get to a certain point where they're like, well, I don't need a mentor. I don't need advice from other people. And it's like, dude, that's actually the, probably one of the times you need it the most because mm -hmm. uh, you're getting into selling a company or going public with a company or uh, merging a company, right? Or buying another company then to merge into it. Like, dude, you, you need outside advice uh, right. for that for sure. It, and it's easy to get positive advice. It's hard to get negative. So true, bro. So freaking true. Especially as you get, as you get bigger and, and people are always like, uh, sometimes I worry about my ideas. Like I have a business idea and, and I'll kind of take it to somebody like, oh, brilliant idea. And I'm like, wait a second. Is it really a brilliant idea or are you just telling me it's a brilliant because you like me right now? Right. Uh, almost like I, I, there's certain people that I know in my network that are um, not Debbie Downers, but they're devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. and I know if I go to them, they're gonna poke holes nonstop into my idea uh, mm -hmm. that I have. And I have another group of people that I go to when I'm like kind of like phase one of my visionary mode mm -hmm. where 
to me as a visionary, like when you're going deep and you're like you're r running this thing, uh, you know, you're seeing something that's not there yet. If you go to certain people too soon that are negative, uh, not not negative, they're more of let's just say the operator side. Um, they can put a buzz kill all over your vision side, um, but if you only stay on the vision side, you don't go th go to this side, then all you have is a bunch of crazy cool ideas that you don't actually know are going to work or not. Right. There's a there's a fine line between those two right there. But I, and I do it in phases. I go to like my vision phase first with certain people, and then I'll go to my next phase, which I'm like, oh crap, here we go. Um, and you kind of go back out and pitch it out to a certain group of people that I know are going to poke holes mm -hmm. nonstop in that in the, in the idea there. It's healthy. It's super healthy, but it's also, you gotta be willing to take that advice that you don't necessarily wanna hear as a visionary entrepreneur, but. Well, that's the key is you have to take the advice too. You gotta yeah. impl implement it. Yeah, you're like, yeah. you know what, you're right, dude. This, that's, that was a stupid idea I had. Mm -hmm. um, on that note right there, dude, I wanna talk to you about money is. And uh, before I say that, uh, depending on when this show comes out, check please should be out by then, by the time the show comes out, yes. as we talked about. Uh, if it's not, you guys just Google it, stay tuned for it, but it should be out by now. Uh, for check, please, if they want to download it, check it out, use it for, at restaurants, they just go to Apple, Droid. Everywhere smartphones are found. And go check, check please. please, is the app itself, they can yes. download, is the app free? Is it a free app? Yeah, free, free app, app. Android, iPhone. They download it and then start Google using it. it on restaurants Absolutely. and uh, uh, help you build out your freaking awesome company here. Yes, please. On check, on, oh, yes, please. On check, please, <laughs> yes, please. All right, man, we're going to hit the money assigned. Great photo here of you. Um, you fill it out here, one, two, three words, whatever it is, fill this out here, and sign it right here, and then me and you all talk about what money uh, means to you in the process of your businesses that you're building and have sold. Is there an eraser on here too? Nope, no eraser. And you gotta make sure you spell the word right because people always mess that up. Oh dear, I feel the pressure. Feel good about it? All right. My favorite part of the show Final here answer. Is, the, is the reveal. Final answer. I get answer? a phone a friend or anything? <laughs> yeah, nope, nope, no phone a friend. What was the other one that you used to get on that show? Um, it was like a- Lifeline. Lifeline, yeah. there's a couple of them yep. that you got like three or four that you could use, right? Uh, all right, what was the answer here? So money is a tool. Money is a tool. Money is a tool. And it's funny, dude, I was literally, um, it's so funny you mentioned that. Uh, before, I, before I go through it with you, I literally used that phrase yesterday in the sense of um, recently my Power Room event, we had Tim Ballard come in um, that uh, helps rescue um, children that are being sex trafficked around the world. And um, one of my, we donated a bunch of money to him and one of my members emailed me yesterday and I didn't know this, but um, their kid they had adopted um, from Haiti, actually, okay. a daughter from Haiti, and, and was telling me the story, and he's like, dude, I was bawling my eyes out, and in the in the meeting when Tim was talking about stories and so forth, and I think about he's because for him it was super real, because he's like, you know, I kind of rescued a kid that wasn't that didn't have you know the, the the things they needed, and and he's like, I was sitting there the whole time thinking about you know where would my daughters, it was two daughters, be if I wouldn't have been there, like they would have been, could they have been in that group, and you know, good chance, and. Um, and uh, then he made the comment, he said, you know, he said, uh, talking about how, uh, how powerful it was to make sure that we use money for, for the right things. And part of the response I wrote back to him is, dude, money is just a tool. Mm -hmm. You've got to go use that thing. It is, you are not taking it with you. It is a tool that has to be used, man. And so it's funny that you mentioned that, because I literally used that yesterday in a super connecting, powerful way with someone that was affected by, like, you know, uh, all the stuff that Tim was going through. So I love it. in your terminology now, money's a tool. What does it mean? It's a tool that should be used to accomplish something. So it, it just like be. a, you know, building hammer, yeah. whatever it is, sure. it, it should be something that, that you use to accomplish something. Hopefully for good, I would submit. Um, but it's not a, uh, I, I don't believe it's a, uh, a way to keep score. You know, the old adage is there's no, no U-Haul behind a hearse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, we all know that, you know, our, in our best day, we might be on, on earth for, Maybe a hundred years, right? Yeah. You know? So while we're here, I think it's it's a tool. It's it's a chance to use it for other things. Uh, everybody has different passions, purposes, um, you know, element of giving, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's it's a way to, and I believe it should be a, a tool to accomplish other things. Uh, it, it's one of the most simplistic 
answers, I think, when it comes to the, when, I, when people on the money to show, but it's the most like truthful answer that I think that's there. Like, if you miss that point of what money is, you have totally missed the concept of business. You have totally missed the concept of you putting in those 16, 17, 18 hour days if, if you're just trying to keep score uh, mm -hmm. on a ledger uh, a side of it. Uh, and like you talk about a tool, whether it be a hammer, a wrench, whatever analogy you want to use, you put that, that hammer has a purpose. Mm -hmm. It has a purpose. That, that hammer can, let's just say, uh, help build a house, mm -hmm. okay? And that hammer was created and built and manufactured by somebody uh, that has a, a purpose that it can serve and it can have other um, uh, effects from it, like a rippled effect, right? Because then you get into, well, there's a hammer and the hammer built a house, but the, the frame that used it, it paid for his meal and his food for his family and it just, it just ripples out, right? right? Unless that hammer never leaves a toolbox. Mm -hmm. And that hammer never leaves that toolbox, it has zero value. It did absolutely nothing for, uh, it, you know, if you bought a hammer when you're 18 and you, in, as your toolbox and you never used it, it literally served zero value for 70 years. It could have done all this stuff and had all this rippled effect. And I think money is the exact same freaking way. Right. You can put that bank account all you want to, right? You can, and, and I'm not against not, not having, like, I'm not against you having money in your bank account. But there comes a point where you've got to go do something with it. Mm -hmm. You've got to go do something with it. Well, that tool should create something, right? So that hammer should be creating something. You should be mm -hmm. fixing something, building something. You should end up with yeah. a house or a, a tool bench or something. Whatever right? it is, right? And Kitchen same, table. Same thing with money. You know, if you use money as a tool, you're ending up with something else. Yeah. And um, that's kind of my. Is, is there any, it. just on that note, and kind of put you the spot here, and, and you don't have to go down it, but is there any certain passion project or thing that you're super. Uh, feel connected to that you try to use money for a lot as, when you can? Is there any certain thing that you drive in you? That's a really good question. I think it changes, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's true. Year, it does. Year to year. Yeah. Um, I think there have been things at different times, um, but even what I'm maybe passionate about today or tomorrow may change uh, in future months. But um, mine has changed several times as I as I I'll go down this road, road, road one road for a while, and and I think it's okay if you if it changes because it's also what fuels the entrepreneur. If, right. you, if you use it the right way, right, it's what provides you the real, real energy. Like the whole purpose of the Money is Show is to, when I created it was to know why do you really, really want money? Like past mm -hmm. the cars, past the house and the watches and all the, the shoes and, but why do you really want money? Mm -hmm. And I think when you find that passion or that cause, uh, which I love the word cause, when you find that cause, it's okay that, that the cause changes periodically uh, because uh, you as entrepreneurs should be getting an insane amount of energy and fuel, if you will, from that cause right. to keep you moving down the, down the path right. of, of when it does get hard. You don't have to have eight companies. You could just have seven or five or four, but you're willing to push that because there's a bigger cause that you're trying to drive for. Mm -hmm. And that cause has got to be big enough to, to, to fuel you. Right. Uh, so I totally agree that, it, that there's several times in my life that it has changed and mm -hmm. I'm totally okay with it. Right. Uh, doesn't mean I don't uh, believe in the other stuff that mm -hmm. I was, but it, I, I, I want that thing that can inspire me and motivate me to push harder. Right. right? So I love your answer, man. Money is a tool. Uh, I love to have you in the, in the office. You've already committed to come back because um, I got like a ton of people I got to introduce you to. I can't wait. Uh, uh, around town. You're such a cool guy. Love all your businesses. Love the entrepreneurial visionary side of you. I can sit in my office and riff with you all day long <laughs> about ideas and technology and, and how to do this. And, and it was cool. I, and I'll give you credit in this idea that I'm working on. I'm like, I laid it all out for you. I'm like, oh, dude, this is like a freaking hundred million dollar business. You're like, no, it really is a hundred million dollar business. And then probably like 30 minutes into it, you had taken it from like a hundred million to like a multi-billion dollar business with some ideas that I hadn't even seen. Mm -hmm. One of them is like stupid, crazy, uh, stupid, crazy, powerful. Um, so, you, dude, you definitely have the visionary side, uh, for sure, man. It's just about being being disruptive. So, oh, what a great word! Think right? about things differently what a great if possible. Word. Love it, man. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. You guys, make Thank sure you. you 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 go download his app. Check, please. Uh, download that app, uh, Android or uh, Apple or any any smartphone. You can download the app, and then also, if you're in the market for some custom shoes, dress shoes, sneakers, whatever it is, uh, female, male, you guys check out um, Modern Casual uh, dot com. Right. Modern Casual dot com. Break the mold. Be unique. Go crazy a little bit. That's awesome, dude. Love, love, love it. Uh, if you guys watch The Money Show, hope you guys enjoy the show. You guys make sure you follow Brian. Check out his companies. He's got more companies coming on the pipeline as well. And uh, we'll see you guys next week on The Money Is Show.